Rainbow Railroad. And Really excited to uh, have the opportunity to moderate today's discussion. Um, this, uh, this discussion today is based on um, a report on the Kakuma refugee camp and the lives of LGBTQI uh, refugees within the camp um, that has been uh, jointly produced by Rainbow Railroad and ORAM, the Organization for Refugees and Migration, um, uh, two organizations that have come together to produce um, a really important important um, uh, body of research and work with the amazing support of our partner, um, John, and uh, amazing uh, partners on the ground as well. And so really excited to not only launch and, and announce this report and the findings that, uh, that are within it, but also host a dialogue and discussion that comes um, at a really important time as we um, dig into you know, the complexity of issues that surround um, the, the circumstances and livelihoods of LGBTQI individuals um, seeking support globally. Uh, Rainbow Railroad, many of you are likely familiar with us, but we are a global non-for-profit that helps LGBTQI-based or individuals who are facing uh, persecution based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics. We offer a suite of different programs and support services to individuals um, inclusive of life-saving support to those facing um, uh, imminent danger and persecution, evacuation, um, uh, support to partner organizations, emergency responses during crackdowns, such as, you know, the most recent uh, events and crisis that we've seen in Afghanistan, and, and also information and um, sponsorship opportunities as well. We, in this, you know, host of different options that we provide to people, rely on partnerships with uh, international uh, organizations and local grassroots organizers and activists who support us in doing what we do. And ORAM is a principal partner in so much of what we do to support individuals, uh, specifically in, in Kenya, where uh, ORAM has a long history of, of working with the LGBTQI community. ORAM is recognized as one of the first international NGOs assisting people fleeing persecution based on their, their sexual orientation or gender identity. And uh, ORAM provides legal assistance, advances economic inclusion through livelihood programs, champions the rights of LGBTQ asylum seekers and provides critical emergency responses. Um, and we are so proud to partner with ORAM and, um, and proud to jointly produce uh, what we are speaking about today. Uh, so that's a little bit about us and what come what brings us here today. Um, you will likely have received the report in an email, but if you haven't, you are able to access the report on either Rainbow Railroad or ORAM's website, and we'll be leaving a link to it as well um, here in the Zoom. Uh, but I really encourage you to go through and take um, a good deep uh, dive into the into the research. We're going to be going over it at a thirty thousand foot view today, um, but really encourage you to dig deep because there's some incredible work that John who uh, I'm going to pass over to do a quick introduction has put together. So um, let's start with you, John. Um, I'll just ask you to uh, to pop on and introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Devon. My name is John Derito. I'm an independent consultant who served as a reader, researcher for the study in Kakuma Refugee Camp. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, John. And Craig. Oh, we don't have Craig yet, I don't think. Uh, I think we're still having some technical difficulties. So we'll skip to um, Brizan. Can you introduce yourself? Thank you, Devon. My name is Brizan Okolani. I'm a human rights activist, having worked with the LGBT refugees in Kakuma refugee camp for the last 16 years. And this is home, and I'm very happy to be part of this panel. And this uh, is a very exciting moment for me as an activist. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Anya. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Devon. So my name is Anya Lyman, and I'm the program manager at ORAM, Organization for Refuge, Asylum, and Migration. Um, so we've been working in Kenya with the LGBT community for a couple of years now and I've been managing the programs here and I'm actually currently in Kenya together with Steve Aram's executive director so hi from Nairobi to everyone and I'm really happy to be here today. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists for, um, for joining today and all of our attendees. Um, so just a little bit of context about the report before, um, before I dive in and, and ask John to start us off with a couple of questions. Um, so, you know, this, this report uh, is something that came out of a deep interest in us continuing to understand um, through evidence-based practice how we can better support LGBTQI refugees that are in the Kakuma refugee camp. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Kakuma refugee camp in the media and within the human rights space um, in convenings as we think about the ways to best support LGBTQI individuals. And the Kakuma refugee camp plays an important role in, in, in this um, in the conversation about LGBTQI based migrant rights because it is such a gathering point. It is this point where individuals are coming from across East Africa and throughout the Sub-Saharan African and MENA regions and more generally to seek refuge uh, given uh, that it is a huge hub for refugee processing and one of the more um, uh, known locations within LGBTQI uh, circles and underground conversations around places to seek refuge and, and, and safe space. Um, but this, this is a complex uh, issue, you know, there in, in the Sub-Saharan African context, uh, 33 out of 54 countries still criminalize same-sex uh, relations. And um, there are frequent, um, you know, arrests and detentions and, and challenges to human rights and freedoms across uh, the continent, including in Kenya, where people are fleeing into um, to seek uh, support and protection. And, you know, um, there's, there are from our kind of, from this report's findings, but then also from, uh, from other kind of anecdotal findings or um, findings from other different reports and, and pieces, um, there, are, there are somewhere around approximately 350 LGBTQI individuals who have fled and reside within the refugee camp and this number continues to grow. And this is, um, you know, a really difficult number to come to given the politics and the complexities of identity um, and outing oneself and coming into an understanding of one's sexual orientation or gender identity within the context of a refugee camp that is hosting thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals who are in really precarious situations. Um, and and we know that challenges are are faced um, by by everyone within within the camp, um, including our LGBTQI um, uh, 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 beneficiaries within the camp and within folks that are seeking protection. Um, we are, have conducted this assessment to really understand the situation, uh, to inform programming, and really to encourage the, um, the use of and prioritization of evidence-based practice, because we really want to ensure that the services that we are providing and the responses that we are, um, we are, we are holding to advocacy and, and policy management are really well thought out. Uh, so with that, I would love to just dive straight into the conversation with John and, and really um, dig into some of the meat of the report. And John, as, as, as he said in, our, in his introduction, is the lead researcher uh, that independently conducted um, all of the interviews and the, and the uh, expert um, kind of testimony that is included within this report. Um, and uh, and did this entirely uh, um, kind of independent of, of Rainbow Railroad and ORAM, and so really is the expert speaking today on the on the body and the meat of the findings of this report. Um, can you tell us, John, a little bit more about how the report came to be and how your involvement um, kind of began? Thank you very much, Devon. <clears throat> yes, like I've mentioned, uh, I'm, as an independent consultant over the last 15 years, I've been working in the field of public health, specifically with key and vulnerable populations. These included transgender persons, men who have sex with men, women who sell sex, among others. And in the course of the work, we have had an interest. With public health, you really need to address both the social and the structural determinants of health. And uh, from this work, I have developed an interest on issues related to migration, both voluntary and involuntary, issues related to LGBTI communities, especially the policy and legal barriers that uh, hinder access and uh, general well being. And uh, it's through these interests that uh, I ended up now partnering with the Rainbow Railroad and ORAM to conduct a study in Kakuma. And uh, 
I'm really excited uh, with what came out of the work and uh, uh, hoping that uh, these will help to inform future policies, decisions, including all the work that we do, be it research, be it program implementation. Great, thank you so much. And during the writing of the report, you had a chance to meet with the individuals that were being surveyed um, and, and really understand the situation that they were in and facing uh, within the camp, um, the good, bad, and the, and the ugly of, of their circumstances. Can you tell us a bit more about meeting with the respondents and what that was like, especially in such a precarious time um, uh, globally and with uh, everything that you were facing? Yes, thank you. Uh, we started this journey in the year 2020. And uh, after getting the necessary research approvals, ethical approvals that were required to conduct a study in Kenya, we had the opportunity to travel to Kakuma and get to interact with the LGBTI community of asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, we worked with a team on the ground that are, is member, that are members of the community who are involved in various initiatives that are currently ongoing within the camp. We worked with a team to purposely sample the LGBTI community in the camp. And uh, we were open to participation according to the study protocol the eligibility criteria was open to every person who either self-identifies or reports a sexual orientation that is either in one of the groups among the LGBTQI plus community. So we worked with the two mobilizers. We did a purpose for sampling, but we also allowed the initial participants to snowball and introduce their colleagues and friends into the study. We worked with a, we managed to interview a team of 60 and uh, it brought a lot of diversity. We had respondents coming from nine different nationalities that include eight African nationalities and one Asian nationality. Uh, in terms of gender identity, we had uh, people self-identified as transgender. And in terms of sexual orientation, we managed to reach out to both to lesbians, gay, and bisexual people. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't encounter anyone who self-identified as queer, and the only intersex person that we managed to reach out to was a minor who couldn't participate in the study because of the requirements of uh, uh, having to be above majority age to participate. However, we had an opportunity to interview one of the guardians of the key informat, and the also managed to capture quite a lot of issues from the community. In addition to the asylum seekers and refugees, we also managed to talk to a number of kin formats, including members of the refugee community. We organizations that are working with the refugees, including the UNHCR, among other partners who work with them, and other CSOs that are working within the camp. It was, um, Quite an exciting moment that an eye opener would say, go to respondents who are willing to participate and let the, us know what they were experiencing and getting to know the, the, the issues that have read to them seeking a serum, the experiences within the camp, their aspirations and what they would like to see done in future which we have managed to capture as part of the reports. Yeah, it's such a such a momentous time and um, and uh, congrats, John, also for being able to conduct this in the complexity of COVID and, and everything that we, that you were dealing with in the pandemic. Um, what were some of the key findings that you that you dealt with or 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 that came out of this? Um, does it, did anything surprise you about the out, the outcomes of the report that you weren't anticipating from the start? Yes, we came up with some ten findings, and uh, yes, some were quite surprising. Uh, others were quite expected. 
And uh, among the findings, and uh, one of the things that uh, literally each and every part participant from among their serum seekers highlighted was the need for continuous active, uh, advocacy against decriminalization. They were of the opinion that if we were to con continuously advocate and uh, reduce the factors that are causing people to free their own homes to seek refuge in, in foreign lands would greatly address the issues. So the issue of decriminalization was kind of a priority among all the communities. Uh, among other things were the need, for example, to fast track the process that uh, the government of Kenya through the different agencies and UNHCR uh, implements to determine the, the refugee credibility of the different uh, asylum seekers. There was a feeling that uh, there might different stakeholders need to come on board and support the government and the different organizations to fast track these. Since a good number of them were reporting having to wait for quite a long period of time before they would get an eligibility interview that would help them maybe get out of the camp and continue with life elsewhere. There was also then call, one of the things that came out of the report is that uh, the community, the, both the host community and federal refugees who are non-LGBTI can be extremely hostile to the LGBTI community. This was not surprising. We in Africa and most of the countries uh, do not embrace uh, sexual diversity. And uh, there are incidences of violence meted on the people were quite heartbreaking. The proportion of participants reporting either various forms of violence, be it physical violence, whether it's uh, verbal abuse among others is quite high. Uh, these calls for a more responsive protection system for the LGBT asylum seekers. And uh, talking to a good number of them, this is not only unique to the camp, but generally even the urban refugees would report the same. We had a good number of them who had moved into the calm foreign change of policies in the government, who had lived in other urban settings were still waiting for processing, and they reported the same. It was uh, very exciting to find that there are some CSOs that are community owned, that are working with the LGBTI community at the camp. And one of the things that um, a good number of the respondents proposed was the need for more coordination among the participants to ensure that uh, we get to maximize the returns on any dollar invested in supporting the LGBTI community of asylum seekers and refugees. The, the one thing, as you mentioned, we did this during the COVID pandemic and uh, with the COVID containment measures, there were quite a number of restrictions, including of movement. This has also, had also resulted in the resettlement of the LGBT asylum seekers into different countries that are better are safer. And there was a feeling that the moment the COVID pandemic is managed, there is a need to fast track and resume that to ensure that at least the asylum seekers who have already gotten the uh, refugee eligibility can move to safer environments. The need to continuously build skills, considering that there is life after serum seeking and life after the camp was important. And one of the things that came out is the violence in the camp is a major obstacle to most of their LGBTI serum seekers getting access to life skills, to build skills that can be useful for them later in life. So there's a need for, 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 for special arrangements some affirmative kind of action to ensure that uh, access to these uh, livelihoods and capacity building opportunities to their serum seekers are available. So there are quite a good number of, uh, of uh, proposals that have been, uh, have been given by both the serum seekers and the Kinfo marks that uh, we have outlined in the report including the need for long-term planning and moving from a humanitarian response to a development program 
to ensure also issues of sustainability in the face of dwindling resources. So these are some of the key recommendations that came out from the interviews with both the, particip the LGBTI serum seekers participants and the different key informats that we interviewed. Thank you so much, John. That was such an excellent kind of um, overview of, of, of this really in-depth report that, again, I'd urge everybody today to go in and do a deep dive into the, the nuances of, of what John is speaking to, because there is quite a substantial amount of information included in the pages of, of the report that, um, that was produced. Um, uh, I think we had Craig for a moment, and, and now perhaps he also um, is... is He's, um, we're still dealing with some tech issues on that end. So I'm gonna um, switch over just to, um, uh, hopefully we can introduce Craig once he's back online, but um, Brazan, I'm really curious to hear from you a bit and, and understand um, what are some of the, I mean, John is speaking to some of these, you know, great challenges that are, that LGBTQI refugees are experiencing in the camp. And, and I'm curious to hear what the current efforts that the Kenyan government is doing to accommodate the needs of LGBTQI refugees. And in your opinion, um, where are they falling short and what needs to change in order to support people better? Thank you so much. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, John, for this really, really well done report. And now I think you will accept my apology as to why when you came for the research, I tried dodging meeting you because I did not want to influence the outcome of this very important research. And you have really spoken the mind of that LGBT person in the camp. And really thank you for that. Uh, back to the question. I just also want to, to tell you that today at a conference, I presented part of your recommendation to the team which we were in the meeting and everybody said that, yes, this is the best way to go. And thank you so much to Rainbow Railroad and Oram for really picking this up. This is something as an activist in the camp, we have really lacked for a long time because every time we go to UNHCR and every time we go to the government, they always ask us, do you have an evidence-based research of what you are talking about? And now we have this document that's going to go a long way in influencing the question that Devon has asked, what is it that the government is doing? The government has had no documentation. The government has had no real feeling, really touch and evidence-based research from the ground, from the refugees themselves, detailing their day, daily experiences. And this document is really very important. So in terms of what the government is doing, the government has even failed to do something for, the, for our community, the Kenyan community. So you can imagine what can they do to refugees? Totally nothing. The government has totally left the matters of security, the matters of policy, the matters of intervention and security of LGBT communities in the camp under the mercy of UNHCR. UNHCR, which is totally overwhelmed by the numbers of refugees in the camp and the local politics from the national government of threatening to close up the camp. So if you put yourself in the UNHCR shoe, it becomes even difficult for UNHCR to start speaking issues around key population to the government because they are like, they have been taken captive by the government. You don't speak around these issues. This is what we want you to speak around. Just protect them, but don't force us to accept these things. So uh, the government has not done much, but. What we can do, the second part of your question is, use documents like this one as our tool of advocacy, right from the government and in the UNHCR. And grassroots mobilization, getting partners to work together, getting strategic organizations right in the camp, empowering LGBTI refugees in the camp to be able to speak up their voice. That is the, the easiest thing we can start in creating a national conversation, a national dialogue 
I really liked what we were discussing today. And every person in this conversation was like, Brisa, this is a document that we would like to use. And I think we are starting at the right point when we have something to really share and speak about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brisan. That's that's a really helpful context and um and 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 clarity on on really what what needs to be done moving forward. Um I want to bring on Craig. Uh Craig, you're with us. Can you hear me okay? And you're we can see yes. you, which is wonderful. Yes, thank you, David. Uh yeah, I got some issues uh connecting, but uh no I'm problem. Over. You're with yeah, us thank- now. So, so good to see you. Um, Craig, I want to give you first an opportunity to introduce yourself and just uh, let people know who you are um, and what you do. And then I, uh, just after you introduce yourself, I'd love for you to just dive in and, and give us a bit of an, uh, um, uh, uh, in your perspective, uh, what the LGBTQI refugee experience is in Kenya and what some of the challenges that you um, have seen and witnessed in your activism and your experience um, look like. Yeah, thank you, Sir Devon. Um, my name is Craig Paris. I'm the Executive Director of Refugee Coalition of East Africa. Uh, we are an umbrella organization that unites several uh, community-based organizations uh, that support LGBTQ refugees in Kenya. Uh, we're currently a membership of 16, strong, and we have two newer members in Kakuma. So we basically uh, try to mobilize resources that help the uh, CBOs that are here in Kenya that are trying to support refugees. We uh, we work with the CBOs and the, the committee members to help with long-term, short-term, and mid-term planning. We also try to build capacities within these uh, different CBOs. We also try to um, implement livelihoods, try to bring sustainability in the community. and. With all the work we've been interacting and working with ORAM, and we've worked also closely with ORAM to even produce this uh, report. It's such a huge tool. It's such a big, um, important tool that we came up with. And I'm glad to be here on the panel to discuss uh, the report. But basically, um, the main challenges that people go through, LGBTIQ refugees go through here, include, but not limited to poverty. There is gross poverty in the community. Um, there is uh, a problem of mental health uh, because of the combination of issues people go through, uh, the mental stress, the mental trauma, also even the poor health that LGBTI refugees go through both in Kakuma and Nairobi. Um, there's also a problem of underdocumentation or improper documentation. Most uh, persons of concerns that are here lack proper documentation even to help them register. You may find that most of them even have frozen cases, uh, for cases that are not moving. They're just people who are stuck in this uh, set of quagmire. They're not registered. They're not neither they recognize as refugees. Um, so basically, most of the issues uh, revolve around that. And also uh, the gross homophobia, considering Kenya has not yet accepted homosexuals or LGBTQ persons. Even the Kenyan movement and the Kenyan community too faces the same uh, issues, but it is more evident in the community because um, people are singled out, people are identified, and they're, they're used on the status, based on the status of, of, of their citizenship or the lack of citizenship. So um, there's so many, there's a peripheral of, of uh, problems that people face, but uh, most of them uh, revolve around those. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Craig. That's that's really helpful context. And, um, you know, I think um, just just quickly to build on that a little bit, um, you yourself coming from from a, um, a lived experience of of dealing with the complexity of of all of these challenges and the and the structural and institutional nuances of everything that happens for a, for an LGBTQI refugee. Um, what is your perspective on the findings of the report personally? Like, how do you, how did you interpret the findings that that John has presented? First of all, John did a tremendous job. John did a great job. Uh, the, the report is really robust. And it's also things that we've been uh, finding out as we go over the time. It's things that we've gone through, or several people that we work with, or even the, uh, the clients we work with have gone through. So just seeing them from uh, 
um, a, a perspective of someone, a researcher, someone who are, has who is not so connected from this uh, community. It's really giving us another way of uh, looking on through them and also uh, trying to find out the best the best way to go about it to find solutions. So for me, uh, especially, I want, really want to concentrate on the recommendation. The ten recommendations really uh, are great to start with because these are the things that I've been talking about over the years things that UNHCR and other partners uh, have been brought to attention, but for some reason have been acted on upon. So uh, for me, the report is a great tool that we are going to use. We actually started using it even with lobbying UNHCR and other partners. I've attended several meetings and this is the thing I bring out and the thing that I, I, I show them, for them also to get um, another nuanced version or perspective from the researcher and also the, the respondents of the reports. So for me, I, I thank Oram and Rainbow Railroads for investing in this. This is a major tool that we are going to use over the years actually. And uh, the recommendations and also the challenges that we identified in the report, um, let's say the mental health issues, the um, sexual assault cases that we have in Kakuma, the lack of livelihoods, um, the gross homophobia, the constant attacks, all those things have been uh, being actually brought to even social media, but we needed someone um, someone to go to on, on ground and get this. So for me, I appreciate this. It's really important that we have such a tool in our work that we do. Great, thank you so much, Craig. Um, Anya, I'd love to turn it over to you um, just to speak a bit to how organizations such as ORAM are contributing to the fulfillment of the recommendations that we've been speaking about. Um, the recommendation uh, number three around CSIs or CSOs uh, providing livelihood support and other support to meet the immediate needs of refugees. And I know that ORAM is, you know, deeply involved in kind of um, working on, on doing this. Um, so I, I'm just wondering uh, how ORAM are, will be contributing to the type of recommendations that have been Thank you, Devon, so much. So yeah, ORAM's work with LGBTQ asylum seekers and refugees in Kakuma refugee camp and Kenya more generally is really centered around economic empowerment, and capacity building of the community where they are. And our work is really aimed at developing sustainable livelihoods projects and building self-reliance within the community and you know, building on talents that they have, skills that they have. Um, and as many of you know, there are you know, limited job opportunities. It's very, very difficult to get a work permit as a refugee in Kenya. And then living in a camp setting anyway, there, there are very few jobs, especially for those coming from the LGBTQ community. So there's, it's really, really important for the community to build income generating activities themselves to meet their daily needs and also break that never ending cycle of dependency. Um, so in 2019, together with Upper Rift Minorities, so Brazan Aram started supporting an LGBTIQ led, refugee led soap making business in the camp. And the aim was really to provide the community with hands-on skills, which would help generate income in the camp, as well as live a more dignified life. And um, currently we're supporting five LGBTQ led groups in the camp and their livelihoods projects. And our approach has really been to provide skills trainings, business trainings on different topics. So I mentioned soap making, also poultry farming, um, two groups, individuals that are really interested in engaging in these projects. And then following these training sessions, groups then have the opportunity to apply for seed funding, which will allow them to start their own businesses, grow maybe existing small businesses in the camp. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Steve, so Aram's ED and I are actually currently in Kenya. And we're now in Nairobi, but to just this morning, we got back from spending a few days with the LGBTIQ refugees in Kakuma. And, you know, it was great hearing the feedback on livelihoods. And it's just been amazing to see how far the community have come, even in the last couple of years and with all the challenges, including COVID as well. And, you know, with our support also, um, individuals have been forming groups and they're currently registering with the Kenyan government 
which also enables them to grow as a community and advocate the wider community and also become self-reliant and through that be able to help more and more members in the camp as well. And of course we do know there are loads of challenges associated with livelihoods led by LGBTIQ refugees in the camp and you know such as access to markets. I mean the report outlines all the stigma discrimination um, that the community face from fellow refugees and also the host community you know, but working together with the members on the ground, we're really looking at finding sustainable solutions to these challenges. You know, and for instance, I mentioned the groups are getting registered with this registration. They can then access markets outside the camp. And so they don't need to do that face-to-face -face sales within the camp and you know, put themselves through potential insecurities. And also one thing that speaking with the members now the last couple of days, livelihoods, livelihoods have a lot of indirect effects as well, such as, you know, on health, mental health, this feeling of purposefulness and waking up in the morning and having something to do. And, you know, with the time spent in transit countries like Kenya being prolonged now, there's really a need for people to have this sense of purpose and belonging and kind of not just sitting around and waiting for something to happen. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point. We had a question in the chat there about how the one of the main um, or in the Q&A about how one of the main findings of the report was that, um, you know, international uh, permanent resettlement is a, one of the most important durable solutions to for folks in the camp. And yet it merits noting that even for those who for whom international resettlement is the the most durable, sustainable long term option, um, that option takes years to materialize for most individuals. And so in that way, time skills development and um, support to to live uh, lives that are not just on pause is so crucial um, and it sounds like um, you know a, a real core part of the work that you're that um, or I'm is doing and others as well who are who are within the context um great so you know we I think that um, Anya, we also speak to a lot of recommendations regarding stakeholder involvement and going forward, how do you believe that different stakeholders can collaborate in a more productive way? What, what do you think it means to be um, to, to encourage more productive collaboration within the context of Kakuma where all of our collective um, uh, goal and impetus and hope for doing this is, is to um, improve the lives of LGBTQI refugees? Mm. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of recommendations that really touch upon that. And one is the need to work with refugee led LGBTQ led organizations on the ground. And, you know, this is something that comes up often, but just can't be stressed enough of the importance of working with those with lived experiences. So those who are on the ground, who truly understand the challenges and the needs of the community, um, you know, and the people with lived experiences need to be involved in program design as well as implementation. And we need to enable them and empower them to provide the services that are really needed. And then secondly, also the recommendation on, you know, the need for more co coordination and not only civil society organizations, but also we know that there are a lot of individuals, activists who are supporting members on the ground in Kukuma. Um, but the problem is, you know, there are resources coming into the camp, but then without optimizing, op optimizing those resources, some individuals may be benefiting multiple times and then others not at all. And, you know, one thing again that we spoke a lot about the last couple of days is that those are truly vulnerable who don't have phones, don't, you know, but have laptops, can't afford internet, um, you know, don't speak English or from countries of origin where there are language barriers. Um, you know, they can't reach out and ask for help. Um, and there's also a high level of illiteracy amongst refugees and you know those are the voices that aren't heard and those are the ones who are forgotten and that's again why it's really important to also work with groups on the ground um, who know the landscape and who know members and can really reach those vulnerable members and then again just that need to not duplicate services because to make sure that all the needs are met because there are a lot of organizations now working in the camp but there's a lack of that information sharing and we really need to focus on building referral pathways between organizations and sharing information with people on the ground of if you need this service, this is the organization that you can reach out to and for us to be able to work together. And, you know, we don't have to each of us to do it all, but if we work to together, we can provide more support and reach more people as well. 
Fabulous. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anya, for that. Um, Brazan, I, I want to pass to you briefly to speak a little bit more to the work that you're doing and the uh, expertise you bring to the communities that you serve. Can you just speak briefly and then I, and we have then we have a great question for you in the Q&A, but um, can you speak a bit to what other work you are doing to support the community in Kakuma? Uh, thank you so much. As I mentioned before, uh, that we have worked for an advocacy work in the camp for the last like 12 years and about. And uh, what we have been doing is have been grassroots advocacy right into the camp and really trying very much to get stakeholders and really working hard at the UNHCR where we have been attending and being part of the security councils in the camp to really advocate for the situations of the LGBTQ communities in the camp. Because as an organization previously, we believed in mitigating the measures in the camp than proactively responding to issues which have been affecting uh, refugees in the camp. And so what we have really been doing has been so much on advocacy. How do we create a favorable environment for these communities to be in the camp? And one of the key things that we have been doing and one of the uh, ongoing project with the Rainbow Rain, uh, Railroad has been to create a transitioning housing. Because you really realize that majority of persons seeking asylum in Kenya, some of them are coming to the country due to flight, due to fear of unknown, due to lack of opportunities. Some of them do not know what to do when you are confronted by uh, homophobic realities. And so they just run away thinking that once they get to the camp, the following day they have a house and the third day they're in Europe, something like that. And so what we do on a very, very confidential and a private um, engagement is we provide transitioning housing where people come, they relax, they understand what it means to go to a refugee camp. Sometimes we take them to the camp and we explore opportunities because we have three opportunities. As East Africans, they are, allowed to work in this region without any difficulties provided somebody is able to come with the documentation. And also um, ability of people being reunited back home and also the chances that people when the two options do not work for them to go back to the camp. And so that has been one of the projects that we are running now and it is receiving very good response. It's a project that we are working with uh, organizations from Uganda and one new organization from Burundi, because one of the biggest challenge is the transitioning of these asylum seekers from their home country to the refugee camp, because majority of them really go through a lot of horrible experiences along the way. You speak with women in the refugee camps and some of them will tell you that they have children as a result of working for police officers on the way who did not allow them to travel because of travel documents. And so they are taken in as house slaves, stay in these police um, centers for long, and they really prolong along. But these are the communities. This is the segment of asylum process that nobody speaks about. We are so much focused into the camp. And so as an organization, we try to see what happens to these people right when they leave their country until the time they get into the camp. And once they get into the camp, we focus so much into advocating for safe spaces for them with key stakeholders. And so we have also partnered with ORAM to really try to set up a base for economic empowerment among these communities. Because again, as, this, as the report has indicated, we really need to empower the refugees themselves to be able to be the team lead in shaping the destiny, in shaping the advocacy narrative of what they would like to see, because it makes a lot of sense for them to speak out their voices, for them to tell their lived realities. And so this is what, as an organization, we focus so much on, as opposed to like direct support, that yeah. as an organization, we do not like give food, we do not support this, but we build capacity of stakeholders and the capacity of refugees themselves to speak out and to be their own voice so that 
because when they speak their own voice, mm -hmm. they bring in innovation, they bring in emotions, and they bring in the realities of their lived day-to-day -day lives. That's that's really helpful. Thank you so much, Brazen. And I want to quickly transition, just in the interest of time, we can, I'm sure we could have this conversation, uh, you know, for for days. But I want to move into some of the wonderful questions that we have in the Q and A. And I, just a forewarning that I'm trying my best to figure out how we can get to as many of them as possible in the remaining ten minutes that we have. But we will do our best to answer any in um, in the chat typing as well if we don't get to all of them live. So I really appreciate all of the question and uh, asked questions asked. Um, but from Blake here we have a question present that I think um, you'd be really well positioned to address and it kind of relates to the what you were just speaking to um, around the Turkana County government and the the part that the Turkana County government has played in pro potentially providing supports and, and maybe for those who aren't as familiar with the context if you can just um, quickly just just define what the Turkana County government's role in all of this is and what that um, what they what role they play in addressing homophobia or incidents of violence. Uh, thank you, Devon. First of all, it's important to note that Trukana is a very, very homophobic community. We have had a lot of incidences in the camp. When the community has gone to the camp, attacked the community, and the government has gone up. Issues around security are the national government uh, responsibility to provide security and not county government. The county government is responsible for provision of health services to all people, including the refugees. But in such a kind of a context where homophobia precedes even any ideologies, then you cannot expect the county government to provide even basic, basic, basic provision to this community. And so I would say the county government has not been able to do anything to support the community in terms of health programming, advocacy. And we have had a number of conversations with them. How do we get make our local hospitals, which are much better than the hospitals inside the camp, be receptive to these communities. But that conversation has not really yielded any fruit so far, but we really hope that uh, with these conversations and with this report, we are hoping something. But to be very honest with you, the county government and the local community being very homophobic has not done a lot and has not, done, has not opened a window for engagement even to listen to the communities themselves. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to also just quickly ask you to, um, and then I'm going to move to Craig to kind of um, potentially add in any context or color uh, to help us answer the, this question. But um, Michael has a really great question um, around the, the specifics and complexities of, um, of advocacy within Block 13. And just for, um, for those people, those individuals' knowledge, for those who may not be as familiar, within Kukuma Refugee Camp, Block 13 um, is a particular um, space within the camp where many LGBTQI individuals are kind of centrally located. Um, and so the question is that um, the report observed that LGBTQI activists from other countries, so in the global north or other countries in the south, um, have been supporting advocacy within Block 13 without potentially considering the context and negative or unintended consequences of their activism. Um, so I, I'd just like us to quickly touch on um, you know, how, um, you know, the, the uh, well, well intended, but potentially um, tricky um, uh, results of, of advocacy without knowing the local context, how, what impact that can have on the community, um, and um, more broadly on the movement. So, Razan, maybe I, I know we, we've spoken about this before, about, about the nuances of it, maybe you can just start off the conversation. And then Craig, I'll, if, if you're comfortable, I'll ask you to kind of round us out and jump in at the end. Yes, thank you. This is a very important conversation. And this is something that some of us have been so passionate in really raising this matter. How do you even go ahead and fundraise for a pride event in the camp? In a country where even being who you are is criminalized. And you want to organize a very open with all rainbow colors, with people marching in the streets of the camp. What message are we sending to this camp community? And so this is a well intended. This is really good. This is who we are. We would like to speak out. We would like to say all the challenges we are facing as refugees in the camp, but is it the right thing? 
a week in considerate of the security of the people we are sending this money to organize this pride. Most of these people sending this money, and that is why of all the people who have wanted to work with my organization, our organization in the camp, I have really high respect to Oram because Oram will always consult with the refugees themselves. What we are doing, is it good? And not just refugees, they will also consult with some of us who have been activists in the camp, that what we want to do, what impact does it have to the community? We are not saying that supporting directly people in the camp is not a problem, but it comes with a lot of insecurity. One, we also need to be very cognizant of the fact that the communities in the camp are really fed up with homophobia, they are fed up with all the challenges they are going through, and the only language the government of Kenya and the UNHCR listens to is when they see blood oozing. When they see blood, that is the only time they will intervene and try to put up some mechanism for support. And this has also been infused into our asylum seekers that if we want to be heard, we need to do something that will trigger the government and the UNHCR to do something. And this is the problem that most of people have been taking advantage of our brothers and sisters in Block 13 to spread a message. And also some people due to fundraising strategies, they thrive so much in the blood oozing from some refugees to share these photos internationally to receive funding. This is wrong. We cannot be yeah. using people's misfortunes to raise funding. This is really wrong. And this is why yeah. some of us have been against this kind of advocacy. Let us work with people in the camp. Let us support them. Let us see what works best for them. I think that's a that's super helpful, Brazan. And I think that the message here is really just that the I mean, and this this shouldn't come as any surprise, but just to reiterate that the best knowledge base and the best source of information about what is going on is from those on the ground who are living and breathing and working this experience. And and you know, we're so grateful to have you and and also Craig. Craig, maybe just quickly, we only have a couple of minutes left, and then I have one more question I'd like to pass to John before we wrap up. So, Craig, do you have any any thoughts on on that question around the complexity of um, international, um, you know, um, well wishing, but for Block 13, but the complexity of this situation on the ground. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I believe they always come from a place of goodwill uh, to try and help, try and because from someone uh, from outside, they may seem like, ah, why is this situation still here? Why are people still stuck? What, what is not happening or what are those people or the organizations forever in Kenya or who have been helping, what are they not doing right? But we always uh, ignore the fact that there's so many layers to this. Uh, there's so many dynamics that come into play, but especially towards policy. Most times um, we are at the mercy of the Kenyan government and their policies and the policies around refugees and all that. And it has always been pushing for this narrative that queer refugees are the same as other refugees, so they don't need any uh, special treatment. And that leads to people even being frustrated, let's say refugees from Block 13, who would want to, uh, let's say, be moved, because obviously, like Brizan said, it, there is so much homophobia in, in the camp, in the host communities, they're very hostile towards gay people. Uh, anything that shows that you're gay, and now, right now, uh, they, they've had that thing that any person who is associated with Ugandans is automatically gay, and that exposes people and leads to being uh, people being assaulted all the time. Uh, that's why you see a lot of blood and all that. It's true, it's really very homophobic, uh, the place, but then again, when people don't um, acknowledge the, the layers and the dynamics that come into play when you're trying to assist these people or these groups, you end up making the, the situation worse. You find that people who are abroad or supporters who are trying to bring, they, they want to maybe support, let's say, pride events so that they, they bring the visibility, but that visibility has a human cost that in the end, when a person knows that this guy is, is, is uh, gay and they're staying alone, they end up being attacked at night and they'll be alone, all alone, and they'll be hacked. 
And that's why you end up, you find most people in block 13 or around that block have been identified and have been at. Oh, seems um, like we may. We need to have, when we are trying to even to bring this assistance, that uh, what are the people around the, the people that we're trying to help, uh, what are they going to see? We've been trying to do this even when we're trying to bring the food relief that how is this food relief going to bring the attention towards the gay people and how are they going to be perceived? Because even when we went to Kakuma, um, the camp management was awfully very homophobic. And when you tried to tell him that we're bringing just assistance to uh, people like us, he felt so offended that are you trying to tell us that you guys are special or more special than the rest of the refugees? So it needs careful trading and it needs to consult people to know how best or how safer they are before we do anything. Because for, for the supporters who are abroad, you they may be comfortable living in their homes, but it's always the, the person in the camp, it's always the person who is down here who faces the, the, the you know, the assault, who ends up being cut, who ends up being beaten. So we need to be responsible as we trying to bring the assistance. Also, let's not um, um, invest in things that can put other people at risk. That you know, uh, this group is bringing this, and it's also exposing other people. And then you end up buying, let's say, rainbow flags. And you know that, yeah, we want to celebrate the gay pride and all that, but always, our lives always have to come first. Our safety has to first come first. So for me, it's always that line, that thin line of wanting to do the right thing but also considering other things other elements uh, in play and also trying to not to overlook other organizations work because we always have organizations that have been helping over the years and they somehow they've understood the system and they, they're trying to uh, maneuver around it without causing any more harm to the, to the groups but uh, other people who are new uh, or who, who get uh, to understand this situation end up coming with this, uh, they end up coming and uh, undermining the work that has already been done because we all know the policies with Kenya and how awfully homophobic it is. We, we are trying to change people who already are saying no to us. We are trying to change people. We're trying to tell people or to recommend to people that, uh, you know, we are gay people, we are LGBTI, we are just here for a short time. We need to be in a safer place. But the people that we are telling this are people who hate on gay people. Even the people in Kenya, the gay people in Kenya also face the same ostracization and discrimination and hate. So we need to be responsible with what we, we, we put across. And we also need to work with everyone. Because if you work with everyone, we are stronger. But if you mm -hmm. try to be an independent supporter and you try to, let's say, fund something instead of funding programs that will benefit the, uh, the bigger picture, you end up even trying frustrating the other LGBT refugees that are there or other organizations, community-based organizations that are coming up to help. So we need to be responsible with our assistance that we are offering. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Craig. I think that's a really important point. And it really brings home what Anya and Brazan were both speaking to around the importance of collaboration and kind of a unifying voice as we move through this um you know really um nuanced issue to kind of find that central point and and really realign on the values that we all are attempting to um you know highlight as we move forward in supporting people and kind of um you know improving the divisiveness that's been kind of throughout this uh this this situation so thank you for your thoughts on that craig really appreciate it um, okay, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up shortly here, but I just want to leave with you, John, um, a, a question here that we had from, from Heather in the chat, um, just around the complexity of verifying incidents. So, I mean, you know, there have been many incidents that have been reported either by individuals or kind of um, in the media um, that are specific either to Block 13 or to, um, you know, uh, violence against the LGBTQI community. And, you know, as you were going through your research, you you stated that how difficult you found it to kind of actually go about in verifying those incidents or speaking to the specifics of them often because of the active investigations, et cetera. So maybe can you just speak a little bit to the complexity of that and, and what it's meant from a research perspective to kind of speak to Block their team. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, one of the things to note is that uh, due to the COVID containment measures, 
uh, we had uh, to conduct our interviews at a venue outside the camp itself. And uh, part of the data correction focused on various services and uh, we, want, we would have loved to also have a feel of some of those services. For example, when we talked about shelter and uh, the condition of the shelters that uh, some of our respondents were living in, it would have been a good thing if I would have had an opportunity to visit uh, the distance uh, to various facilities within the camp. Uh, specifically on the violence incidents that uh, have been referred to, we got reports of that and uh, we, you get to appreciate that uh, from a research perspective, you want to remain as objective as possible. And uh, getting the perspective of one individual who's likely to be the victim may not give the comprehensive uh, picture of what could have happened. Or if you get to find the, uh, the only the opinion of the aggressor, that might not give you a comprehensive picture. So the fact that we couldn't walk in to the camp and uh, uh, get to identify, uh, observe, uh, get our alternative opinions could have limited some of the uh, of our ability to present some of the issues uh, comprehensively. However specifically to the issues of, uh, of violence. I think uh, we managed to confirm from both the respondents and also some of the providers who provide services, especially the post-GBV providers within the facilities that could, could give us a picture when, when we talk about the incidents of, I mean, the prevalence of the violence towards the community we can authoritatively say yes is that high from the perspective of the victims themselves and also from the service providers. That's really helpful. Thank you so much, John. And um, you know, I think um, as much as we'd like to all keep uh, kind of digging into this, we're going to have to pause it there for now. But um, again, thank you so much to all the amazing um, panelists today, and for your thoughts, Brazan, Craig, John, and Anya, much appreciated. Um, and uh, thank you so much to everybody for for attending and for asking such wonderful, thought provoking questions. I wish we'd had a chance to get to all of them, but we will do our best to respond in writing to everything, um, either already in, in, in the function or, or afterwards in follow-up. Um, I really want to um, encourage everybody again to take a, a look at the report and to visit both Rainbow Railroad and ORAM's websites and also investigate and look into the important work that Brazen and Craig are doing with their respective activism and work on the ground. Um, obviously, of course, uh, ORAM and Rainbow Railroad will continue to work with them um, as well, but uh, really just encourage some, um, some investigation into the specific work that they're doing um, independently as well. Um, and and bit, again, finally, a big thank you, John, for all of the hard work that you put into this. It's been a multi-year project, so just really appreciative of the persistence and commitment to doing this in an objective and, um, and centered and focused and rigorous way. So really thank you for that. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll close out today. Thank you everyone so much and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, depending on what time zone you're in. We're coming from all over the world. So I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.